Welcome to the Garden Talk Podcast, where we interview growers from all over the world, both beginners and experts, seeking to learn more about what they know about gardening and how they do things in their garden. What's up, everybody? For you that don't know me, my name is Chris, aka Mr. Grow It, and you're tuned into the Garden Talk Podcast. This is episode number 128. In this episode, I interview Matthew Gates. He is an IPM specialist and has been on the podcast once before, episode 48, where he talked about the top 10 garden pests and how to combat them. I'm happy to have him back on the podcast so we can get deeper into pest management. In this episode, he reveals some of the best ways to prevent and eliminate pests. If you want to see short clips of these podcast episodes, search Garden Talk Clips on YouTube. I also have a gardening channel where I show off the plants that I've grown. I'll have both of those channels linked down in the YouTube description section below. One of my goals for this podcast is to bring free information about gardening to the general public. That being said, I'd like to thank the sponsors of today's episode who helped make that goal possible. Thanks to AC Infinity for sponsoring this episode. Check out their Instant Potting Mix, a soilless grow medium made from 100% organic cocoa coir fiber. It's buffered and triple washed to maintain pH stability and reduce salinity. It comes in a two pound brick, which expands to fill up to a three gallon grow pot. Click the link in the description section below so you can learn more about their Instant Potting Mix. And the discount code MrGrowIt15 works on both Amazon and their website, acinfinity.com. Stash Blend. Stash Blend is a 2-1-5 plant additive that can be used with synthetic bottled nutrients or in living soil systems. Simply mix half teaspoon of Stash Blend into a gallon of water, then water your plants with it. Ingredients include corn steep liquor, seaweed extract, humic acid, beneficial bacteria, silica, and mycorrhizal fungi. Check it out at stashblend.com, link in the description section below, and use the discount code THESTASH. And we're back. Welcome to the Garden Talk Podcast. Today, I'm joined with Matthew Gates. How are you doing? I'm doing very well. Welcome back to the podcast. Second time around. First time we talked about pests, some of the common pests, what they are and how to combat them. Great, great conversation, just loaded with information. I mean, you have so much knowledge when it comes to pests in particular, and you've got other areas of knowledge as well, which I'm hoping we're going to get into today's episode. But yeah, welcome back to the podcast. I'm glad to have you back on once again. Can you introduce yourself for those that didn't catch the first episode we did together? Yeah, absolutely. So my name is Matthew Gates. I'm an integrated pest management specialist. I take a holistic approach to pest management. I like to consider many different kinds of factors. And I'm the founder of Zenthanol Consulting. So I'm a professional uh, consultant with regards to IPM and um, pest management advisory. And um, I work with all kinds of people um, at commercial levels and also for private as well. And I'm excited to talk about all echelons of pest management from the strategic to the the lower level. Awesome. And we actually had the chance to meet in person pretty recently over at the Soil Life Summit in Pahrump, Nevada. Awesome, awesome event. And you had a talk there actually, you had a, a great talk, which I watched the replay on it on the Grassroots website, but great, great job there. And uh, yeah, I'm excited to uh, to get into this one. Thanks. I really appreciate it. Worked hard on that one. Let's start with IPM. I have to warn you, some of the folks that I have listening to this podcast are beginners, although we do have some intermediate and advanced as well. So starting with IPM, what is IPM? And then also get into the Everswarm concept, which is something that I actually learned from you. Yeah. So this Everswarm concept is an idea that um, I've kind of come up with, although to be honest, it's not like super unique. It's just a way of rethinking certain aspects of like ecology and biology and in particular through the funnel of how can we as cultivators most sustainably or most um, efficiently tackle the issue of pests, especially as they move between continents and are always constantly evolving and adapting. So it's about being able to disrupt the sort of system and and preferably, ideally, using um, many different kinds of pathways to that objective, Um, ways that will like, so you don't have chemical resistance, for example, which we've seen in agriculture. That's the common example, but pests can get resistant to things like biocontrols too, microbial biocontrols, uh, bacteria and fungi and that kind of thing, or even viruses that are used. So if we if you understand like a, a greater sort of um, ecological theory, then you can understand why certain techniques do or don't work 
um, and which ones are most relevant and what's the most practical thing. A lot of this is really sort of high, high level stuff, but it can be broken down into the mechanisms of interactions between plants and pests. And IPM essentially is all about doing that kind of thing. And uh, as a concept, obviously, a lot of these concepts are sometimes even ancient, but uh, generally speaking, IPM has been around since like the 1950s or so. And it's this idea of integrating different management practices for pests. And it's evolved over time, too. Has a lot to do with like preventing pests, right? So a lot of these things you're actually doing before pests are visible, right? Before pests are even there. And I have a IPM routine that I do. Um, you know, I can't say that I'm super strict on it. But uh, there are some things that I do in my garden, indoor garden in particular. I mostly grow indoors, although I do have a vegetable garden outdoors. Uh, but there are some things that I do in order to try to prevent pests from invading my grow space. And I'd like to kind of go over some of my IPM methods, my routine, really. And some of these things that we're about to go through, I don't do on every grow. Some I do do on every grow. I'd like to kind of get your feedback on some of these things and kind of get some more details on things. So. First off, I think pretty straightforward is scouting plants. A lot of people say, oh, yeah, scout plants. Look at your plants. Some people do it every single day. Some people are like, ah, oh, you don't need to do that often. Every week or so, you want to look at plants. Some people say, hey, that's not frequently enough. You can certainly get an infestation and have pests take over your grow space in a faster period of time. So you want to have them frequently. Now, as far as scouting pests, what's your opinion on how often to scout and also where to scout, right? Are we looking at the soil? Are we looking at the bottom part of the plant, we look on the top part of the plant, so on and so forth. Yeah, so basically, I think IPM and, and crop scouting in general, whether you're doing it in like one single tent or a large field or however your context is, it's always going to be context dependent. Where you're at also matters a lot. Uh, like you kind of say here, like sometimes you can get away with not doing it every day. Some people, it's a little bit different. Everyone's context is a little bit different. So you have to find the right uh, plan for your particular scenario. But yes, generally speaking, crop scouting is very important. It's, I think, the foundation, because if you don't know what's going on in various ways, you won't be able to make an informed decision. And a lot of these pests can be uh, pretty difficult to see or are invisible to see when they start, like the germination of powdery mildew and leaves, for example. It's like, you know, 100 plus hours before you're going to even possibly see like the mildew grow or something like this. And when you're looking, you want to look at various parts of the plant, not just the foliage. You know, if, if it's in flower, look at the flower, look at the leaves, look at the stems as well. Look underside the leaves. A lot of times insects and mites will like be on underside the leaves. Um, you know, look also at the roots if you can. Sometimes you can, sometimes it's harder to do that depending on your context, but look at every aspect of the plant. And also, um, you know, if you can incorporate other kinds of sensors besides the Mark 1 eyeball, you know, there's other things out there that people use to um, give them a better idea about what's going on in their local environment. I think one of those common things is using one of those handheld microscopes. I think they're like a 10x or a 30x microscope in order to kind of see things. That's what I use. I know that yeah, you mentioned can't really see everything with the naked eye, right? So it's like having a hand scope in there can be beneficial to see some of those really microscopic pests. Yeah, definitely. Now, yellow stickies, that's another thing I wanted to talk about. That's something I use really not as something to eliminate pests, but to identify that the pests are there. So I personally have yellow sticky traps kind of just stuck into the soil. You usually have one in each pot. Some people may say that's an overkill. Others say, no, that's perfectly fine. I know some people use the yellow stickies and they put them by the soil. Some have one hanging up in the air. What's your take on yellow stickies and how to use them properly? Well, I like what you said at the beginning that a lot of people do. Uh, there are there are like glue traps, so to speak, that you can use that might be more about like killing a large amount if you get like a bunch of flies or other kinds of flying bugs around like thrips. But generally speaking, yeah, yellow, yellow glue traps are not for uh, disposing of the pests. It really is about sampling them. And I would say that if you're in a small tent, a lot of times in commercial settings, like a standard sized card uh, might be used for like per greenhouse or, per, or for like a larger section than you might normally typically see in a smaller tent. So maybe one is good enough. Um, putting one in every single one, though, like I think that's just a, a matter of like how many are you getting in a pack and and how much how long how often are you um, replacing them? 
typically I advise people to replace like in a commercial setting every week. If you have the, the labor and the capabilities to do that. Um, and I think from a home grow perspective, that's also true as well, no matter what plant you're growing. Um, because if you have, if you take it off every week, you put a new one in and then you look at what was in the old one and you take note, you might see things like parasitoid wasps. You might think, see things like, uh, flies or even like a house fly or something that you know is not a pest, but it was around in your house or something. And being able to discern the difference between different things is very crucial for making it, uh, you know, most maximal in the way that you deploy it. Really good points there. Now, another thing that I like to do is uh, avoid going directly from my outdoor garden immediately to my indoor garden. And I know some people say hey, that's an overkill, but others swear that you can certainly bring in pests from the outside in your indoor garden. So I'm often taking off my clothes, changing my clothes between my outdoor and indoor, indoor garden. Would you say that's a, a good practice to do or is that kind of an overkill? Can't say it's a bad practice. Um, I think that's totally valid, especially because like in different seasons, you know, like in winter time, maybe you might feel a little bit safer, uh, you know, because there might be less things out and about. Whereas like during spring and summertime, you know, I, I will be walking and I'll be like hiking and I'll see like an aphid or something, you know, blow onto like my shirt or jacket or somebody else's shirt or their hair or something like it does happen. Now uh, you might not realize it, but it does. And um, I would also say that like in a similar vein, if you get like fresh produce, you should check that too. I live in California. So I know that there are different pests that can get into produce like thrips in berries, like raspberries and blackberries. I definitely see that all the time. And so people are wondering, they might even treat a thrips problem. Everything's fine. Then they come back again. Like, how did this happen? That's by, um, that's your biosecurity procedure uh, taking effect. And so I think that changing your clothing before entering your grow space is certainly valid. I didn't even think of bringing it in on your produce. That's yeah, that's interesting. Next up on the list, I have diatomaceous earth. So this is something that's commonly used. I know we kind of talked about this a little bit. We touched upon it in our last episode, but I wanted to bring it back up because something that I've done in the past, I don't do it every grow, but I've done in the past where I sprinkle some diatomaceous earth on the top of the medium. And from what you hear through the grapevine is that it really helps prevent things like fungus gnats. Helps. Uh, they, they Apparently it's like glass shards to them and it's really hard for them to kind of be on top of the medium. Uh, I'm not sure if it destroys their exoskeleton or what, but I know in our past episode, you had mentioned that you had some concerns about the effectiveness of diatomaceous earth using it. What are your thoughts on diatomaceous earth? Is it still kind of something where the effectiveness is questionable or uh, is this something that's kind of proven to be helpful in preventing pests? Yeah, I mean, di diatomaceous earth has its place for sure. Um, but I feel like when you apply it on soil, when it gets moist, it's not effective anymore. So since substrates are usually getting irrigated, um, that kind of hampers its effectiveness in that way. Uh, but, but, you know, despite saying that, and despite also mentioning that I've um, read a bunch of research about using them, especially for fungus gnats in particular, apparently it was not found to be very efficacious. But people report it being uh, effective for them. So I wonder if there's something going on with certain pests. I mean, when people say pests, that's kind of broad. Uh, but, you know, specific kinds of pests might be totally unaffected, whereas others might be. Also, how are you evaluating that, I think, is very important. If people just apply it and they just don't get any pests because they just weren't there, you can't really attribute that to having like a, a resistant effect, if that makes sense. So I think also people should pay attention to how they're evaluating different products um, in the first place. Where I would use it um, would be like a, on a hard surface that's not typically getting moist or hydrated and then using that as like a physical barrier. Cause you're right. What happens is that the, the diatoms that are harvested in the ocean, they have these silicate bodies and they crush them up into like basically glass. And then the insect cuticle, which is like a armored, you know, body, there's little joints and those shards can get into them and they can cause a problem. And so it's like getting all cut up by glass shards while you're in a suit of armor. It's not a pleasant situation to be in. Super interesting. And so you said hard surface. Could you give kind of examples on what you mean? Yeah, by like a floor, it? perhaps. Like maybe oh, okay. like outside the yeah, like at the threshold between like a door of like two rooms or something. If um, if it's typically not getting like really maybe on the outside potentially, like that's how people use for like home pests, like ants and and that kind of thing. Okay, got it. 
Let's talk about sprays next. A lot of people will use sprays as a preventative. Uh, I used to rotate my sprays. I used to do like neem oil one week and the next week do peppermint spray. The next week do a rosemary spray. <laughs> I've used products like Mammoth Can Control, which is, uh, from my understanding, I think it's a thyme oil and a corn oil, if I remember correctly. And then there's also the amazing Dr. Zymes, which is a product I've used and been very, very helpful for not just pest prevention, but also like eliminating pests as well. Can you give us your overall thoughts on those type of products I mentioned and kind of the rotating, maybe some best practices on rotating them? Yeah, well, I would say that like, um, I think that your context really dictates whether I would personally use it or not. For example, if you have um, a situation where you typically get a lot of pests, like kind of constantly like a low pressure, but still present, like thrips are really famous for this kind of thing. They'll get in, they won't, maybe you can keep the population from getting high, but you're constantly having them. And if you know that they're coming around like late spring and summer, then maybe you start applying this um, previously before you have a problem and then you don't have like this population increase. Um, so you could go at like a weekly rate or a bi-weekly rate of some sort of like a, like a pyrethrin product, for example, or maybe as a Directin or something like in veg, but you have to be careful. And I'm very hesitant about using things in flour, not necessarily because, because a product might be non-toxic or might volatize quickly or something like this where you don't have residual. However, you might still like disrupt the trichomes or other sorts of things that might be a quality control issue. So in some cases it might matter. In some cases, uh, I would not necessarily um, go that route. Okay. And rotating the, the sprays on like a weekly basis, for example, is that effective, would you say? Because uh, I think you touched upon this in the beginning of the episode where it's like pests can kind of get used to it, right? So if you're spraying neem every single week, they can get used to it and then it's not really doing anything to them. So rotating around, peppermint is a common one that you hear about using, rosemary, those three in particular, I used to rotate around every week. Would you say that could be effective for the average home grower? Is there a different spray that you would add in or replace? Yeah, well, I think that, so like the products that you're talking about, they, they work kind of broadly against a lot of different like insect and mite pests. So if those are the things you're concerned with, then yeah, that could be helpful. Although I would say that typically, I think from that Everswarm concept we talked about, if you want to disrupt a system, you want to have redundancy. That can mean greater costs sometimes because you have different products being applied that kind of do similar things or do them in a different way. And that might seem too redundant, but actually it's helpful for resistance management. Um, also, when you're applying these products, like you don't know what pests you're going to encounter. So an insecticidal agent is not going to affect like a fungus, for example. So again, when you're rotating, a lot of that's, I think, going to be based on what when you normally encounter these pests. So like maybe in autumn and, and winter, perhaps you get more fungal uh, problems. Maybe it rains a lot more where you're at. And so you might start applying like a potassium bicarbonate product, which is going to have like a pH effect on the foliage and has negative effects against like powdery mildew. But you might follow that up with like an oil product or something that also uh, harms the spores and also kills the fungi in a different way, just as an example. Understood. The last one I want to talk about here on my IPM routine, things that I've used in the past for IPM, maybe not every grow. And actually, I've used this particular product as well in order to battle fungus gnats, which is mosquito bits. Now, I know it's there's mosquito bits, there's mosquito dunks, there's a couple different products, but it's all essentially the same thing, which is a type of bacteria, right? BT. Can you talk to us about BT? You know, what is it? What it actually does in regards to pest elimination and or pest prevention? Yes. So BT stands for Bacillus thuringiensis, and it is a species of bacteria with various strains. Now, you have different ones out there that are available. So some like Israelensis are used against flies and fly larvae, especially. Um, Kirstaki and Izawi, for example, are used against caterpillars, typically. And if you use the wrong strain, it will usually not have very much of an effect at all against the, the misapplied target. And how these work is essentially that these different strains, they produce various proteins, like cry proteins, for example, for caterpillars. And those, they all are toxic for the caterpillar or the fly larva. It gets into their gut. It um, 
gives them sepsis and they die very quickly. So it's not a great way to go out. Um, people are sometimes concerned because they think that maybe the BT would be uh, harmful for themselves. Uh, but it's actually very, very narrow um, in what they affect. It can't affect us. And also they require a alkaline gut, which caterpillars, for example, have um, to damage them. So we don't have that kind of gut anyways. So that's how it works. And it was pretty effective, in my opinion. It's one of the better things to use against things like budworm moths, for example. The only thing is that the organism has to come into contact with enough of the of the proper goals that you're applying. And usually that does require them to f- be feeding at that time. So you're in this situation where you have to apply it and you have to apply it early and you have to apply it before the first sign of like budworms, for example, or fungus net larvae or something like that to have the, the best effect. Now, can you overdo it with BT, right? So like adding it to the soil, we always hear about having a balanced soil food web, right? And if you're continuing to add this in over and over and over again, this particular species, well, can this dominate and kind of throw things off in, in regards to the balance of the soil food web? That's a good question. And although other microbes, maybe this would be more true for, um, BT, I don't think so much because it's kind of an obligate or maybe a facultative, uh, or facultative uh, uh, parasite. So other bacteria and fungi in the in the uh, phytoplane and the rhizoplane, the foliage surface and the root surface, um, I think you'd probably want maybe a, a different kind of bacteria or fungus, um, or you'd, you'd consider something different uh, that would have that kind of disruptive effect potentially. Okay. Next up, I have a viewer question. So this is actually a viewer from our last episode. He commented and he wanted to get your thoughts on a few things. So the question is, how do you feel about pyrethrin and spinosad for IPM? Both are entirely organic and are approved for use on medicinal plants. And they're both some of the well-tested products for IPM. Also, what are your thoughts on Benir... I'm going to butcher this one. Benveria bassiana, <laughs> a fungus that attacks pests. So I think pyrethrin and, and spinosins, which make up spinosad... Uh, those are pretty effective. They are also, I would, ca- I would cause, I would call pretty, pretty safe. I feel like um, compared to other products, like so people learn about like systemic compounds and things you shouldn't be using in medicinal plants and potentially other plants too, because they get into like the nectaries, um, like neonicotinoids do this sometimes or a lot of the time. And then insects like honeybees come in or, na- or native pollinators, they come in, they feed on it and they die. And that's not great. So, you know, really consider those sorts of products when you're applying them. Uh, but I do like to use pyrethrin because pyrethrins, um, they volatize really quickly and they decay in the presence of water and sunlight, which you get a lot in various kinds of uh, situations, right? So pyrethrin doesn't stay as a rig- residual, which is nice. And as far as um, sort of other products, I do like Bouveria bassiana. I like to use it quite a bit. You can not really overdo it for the most part. It's typically kind of expensive though, so you're probably not going to be doing that. Um, but it's a broad spectrum entomopathogenic fungus, which basically means that it's a fungus that can feed on various kinds of mainly insects like thrips, even aphids. I like to use a lot against root aphids, for example. So yeah, I have a lot of applications for Bouveria. And there's different strains of Bouveria too. And also Isaria fumosorosia is another fungus that you can maybe use in lieu of Bouveria if you can't get Bouveria. Awesome. Now, are there any sprays, whether it be those or any other sprays out there that are safe to use in the flowering stage? You know, I'm not somebody who can uh, say that like some of these products have been tested because unfortunately there's not a lot of the research that I would normally rely on. Uh, if I want to be intellectually honest, but I think that, for example, like the BT I'd mentioned earlier, I feel pretty comfortable with that. Um, in some cases, the pyrethrin feels pretty comfortable, although I'm very hesitant to use it past like the very beginning of flower, um, just primarily because I don't like how, um, for one thing, when you get these products, the pyrethrin product itself might be fine and it might volatilize very quickly. But if you don't know what other products are being used, like inertly in uh, products that you buy, right? So like if you could just snap your fingers and just apply pyrethrin, that's one thing. But when you buy a commercial product, like one time I had an example where I was working with a client. They had been buying a pyrethrin product. It was fine. No problem. Then one day 
they get um, one that has an enhancer called piperinol butoxide, which you're not supposed to use or you weren't supposed to use at the time. And they had no, they didn't know how this happened. Uh, they tested it. They, we talked to the, the supplier. They don't know how it happened. So it just has given me pause ever since experiences like this, you know, so like, don't just think that, uh, just because the label says one thing, you know, sometimes there's weird batches and things like that to consider. That makes sense. What about Jadam wedding agent? I've heard a lot of people using that as like a preventative and somebody actually mentioned that was safe to spray and flower. Would you agree with that? Disagree with that? Or what are your overall thoughts? Yeah, I don't have a lot of experience with Jadam, but um, I do uh, talk to a lot of people who do use it a lot. So uh, personally, I don't have a very informed opinion on it, to be honest. Um, as far as using it like in veg and something like that, I'm not really against it necessarily, but in flour, I'm not sure as well. Okay. So that's pretty much all that I've done in the past as regard as a preventative for IPM. Now, are there any other IPM methods that I should consider adding to my routine? Well, you've, you've got good crop scouting. So you might, for example, entertain the use of well, how big is your area? Uh, I'm working in a 13 by 13 room. Okay, so um, I would say that you could consider maybe if you wanted to splurge, like there's different echelons to this. If you wanted to splurge, you might be able to get some of these uh, highfalutin cameras that they got out there that are like AI. You see people using those. Um, uh, there's a product I saw recently where um, it, it flies around on like a, um, cables, uh, like, like a thread, like really, really thin cables, and it takes pictures of your, of your canopy. And it uses AI to kind of look at uh, the different spectra of the foliage and check for different changes in growth and that kind of a thing. But uh, that's really mostly speculative. That's one thing you could do on one extreme angle, uh, maybe if you have more plants. The other thing that you could do, though, is you could consider adding um, a plan of various pests that you normally encounter and even just tracking when uh, you encounter them during the year. And once you've got sort of a regularity, you then might look and see if you have products that you could add like a, an additional mode of action to, or maybe attack a certain life stage. So for example, ideally, if you've got like a fungus gnat, there's an egg, a larva, an adult stage, and a, and a pupil stage too. If you can attack every single life stage and ideally with multiple modes of action, that's like the ideal. And so if you almost always get only fungus gnats, maybe you would spend a little bit of extra um, resources to uh, increase that robustness potentially. Or you might realize that that's very expensive and what you're doing now works fine and it's very efficient and economical. So it's all context dependent. I appreciate the advice. One other thing that comes to mind that people are starting to use these days and I want to get your input on is UV light. I think it's UVC light in particular is what they're using to shine onto both the soil as well as the undersides of the leaves. What's your take on that? Is that an effective solution for pest prevention or elimination? Absolutely. It's been used for a long time. Um, so UV light being used as like a pesticide also like for insects, for mites, for fungi. Um, it's been around for a long time. Uh, I used to know some Dutch growers who use it in glass houses on like a boom, like you would use like a boom sprayer in a large greenhouse, and they would just attach lights to it. Um, dosage is very important because, and also being very safe with its uh, use because you don't want those lights. To, so UVB and UVC are detrimental to your skin, detrimental to your eyes. You don't want to hurt yourself. Uh, there was a famous... Um, a party that happened recently for some like NFT, like uh, monkey coins or whatever those things are. And they put UV lights that were harmful to your eyes. People went to the club and they reported having like partial blindness and things like this. So you got to be careful. You know, you go to a party, you see UV lights there. You don't know what they used. Anyways, my point is that you should be concerned about um, the safety. But if you use it responsibly, it's highly effective. And you don't even have to dose for very long. So it basically works because the UV light gets through the cuticle of the insects or the fungi, and it basically disrupts their DNA, and they die pretty quickly. So that's why it's really highly effective. And I think if uh, more people were to implement them, it's important to know your setup and also to know um, the best way of applying it. Because in my opinion, the best way to do that is at a level, a uh, stable range where you know 
how far the light is from the canopy, and you also know, uh, and you can be consistent in your dosage of how long the lights are on for, which shouldn't be too long typically. Yeah, I've heard as low as five minutes a day. Some people say 10 minutes a day. Is that reasonable? I think that's even sort of... Um, sort of long in some cases. Uh, it depends on the frequency though um, of the of the ultraviolet radiation. And I think it also depends maybe even like if you're doing it, if you're just having them on or if you're like moving them around um, to get like an even spread or something like that. But uh, for example, I know exa- I know situations where people in research have used it against powdery mildew and botrytis and they only need to apply it for a few minutes. I know UVC light, I believe, also comes in some air purification systems. So I have one of the systems where it uses UV light as well to help destroy, I don't know if it's the viruses that get caught in the air filter or what, but I thought that was pretty interesting. Yeah, it's a great way to use UV too uh, for air filtration. That's part of that biosecurity where um, having like filters and just understanding like where these organisms are coming from. Because people will ask me, they're like, my plan works really well usually, but I keep getting these problems that keep coming in. And for people who are experienced and kind of know what they're doing already, usually it's some sort of breakdown in your information pipeline. Um, you know, something that you thought was a true is a false, basically. <laughs> like maybe you thought that you were secure, but oh, there's a hole in your greenhouse. Or maybe you thought everything was fine, but your vents, you know, your filter isn't working or you don't have a filter. You forgot to replace it. Like something is there's a breakdown in the reality that you thought you were existing in, basically. So you have to go sh- put on your Sherlock Holmes cap and, and check around. Moving on from IPM, let's get into some other things. Uh, I know you want to talk about mites, insects. Maybe we can get into fungi, bacteria, viruses. Let's start with mites. Talk to us about mites and solutions to eliminate them. Really just kind of giving you the microphone here and drop some knowledge bombs on us. <laughs> For sure. So I think the big one that most people are dealing with, like with uh, not just medicinal plants, but in general, are like two spotted spider mite. Um, I've talked about it extensively. They feed on like 4,000 plus plants. Spider mites are really good at adapting to different plants, and they can even have populations become very specific on different species in as much as a few generations where they've, uh, where they adapt their genes very, qu- very quickly to the host plant. Um, so spider mites are very common, but there's also a lot of solutions for them. I like to use things like wettable sulfur, for example. That can be very helpful, unless it's harsh for a particular plant that you're applying to. So always be careful. Always apply a little bit to see uh, if the plant has a, a phytotoxic response or something like this. That's always helpful for other products that are new that you haven't applied before. You can also use biocontrols. I'm a huge fan of using things like uh, persimilis mites or californicus mites or things like that. I also like to use them preventatively. I think that's their most efficient use case, although it does require the um, you know the uh, best practices and uh, the use cases, knowing your quality control, knowing your sourcing. Are you getting them from a tertiary distributor or a primary producer? Um, how many are you applying? Are you applying too many for your location? And maybe you're in a a smaller area and maybe even the smallest increment of the biocontrol you can get is kind of overkill already. So you'll have to make those choices yourself. This will be true for most biocontrols. Russet mites are also a big deal, uh, obviously in medicinal plants, but um, also in a lot of other plants too. I dealt with rose russet mite in uh, uh, like eight years ago with Gerber daisies and roses and things. And that costs a lot of uh, money and it also costs the supplier like a million dollars to like retrofit everything because it cause it transfers a virus so the rest of mites that other people are dealing with and other plants this is not necessarily the case but in the rose res- rest of mite that was the case and anyways the way that you deal with them is um, you got to be very preventive usually they're very small their damage is very overt though so if you see gnarling and curling then you know you're looking at something that might be a rest of mite other damage can look like rest of mites, but um, if you see this like sort of crinkling damage, that's typically a, a telltale sign. Broad mites are like that too. Uh, but if you are dealing with rest of mites, one thing to note that I think a lot of people don't realize is that rest of mites are very specialized. So most of the time you're only dealing with specific species. So for example, if you're, if you're growing coconuts or you're growing a medicinal plant and you've got tomatoes and you know there's a tomato rest of mite, 
the tomato resin mite probably won't be able to feed on uh, your other plants, if that makes sense. So that's something that I see people getting um, confused about online a lot. And I have a video on my YouTube channel that basically talks about all kinds of resin mites, where they come from evolutionarily, how did they adapt the way they did, and what you can do to defeat, defeat them. Same with spider mites and a lot of these other pests as well. I have been fortunate enough not to come across spider mites or russet mites, so fingers crossed that that never happens. I'm going to knock on wood right here and hope that it, it never happens there because I heard that both of those are very tough to combat, particularly the russet mites are is said to be more tough to combat than the spider mites, but spider mites can be very difficult to combat uh, from what I hear, particularly when you're in flowering because it's harder to kind of, you know, you, you don't have the sprays to really fall back on. And uh, once they get out of control and start webbing, it's just game over from there. Yeah, they're really difficult. I feel like uh, they represent two ends of a spectrum of what kind of pests you can deal with. On the one hand, you've got spider mites, super common, in my opinion, less difficult to deal with. Although if you let them get out of control, they all become very hard to, def uh, to deal with. On the other hand, you've got resin mites, which I feel like are a little bit less common for people. Maybe it depends on where you're at. and But they're much more extreme in their damage when you get them. And the damage they cause is typically like permanent afterwards. You get stunting, you get the other problems. So uh, you have different maybe threat levels for different pests. I want to get into insects next. But first, I'd like if you could explain the difference between mites and insects. Yeah, sure. So they last they last share a common ancestor like over 500 million years ago, even though they look kind of similar. They're actually very different. So mites are like uh, arachnids, you see. So like spiders and their, their relatives in that group. They've got eight legs. They typically have eight legs, but like rest of mites only have four because they're, well, they've lost a lot of genes over time. Let's put it that way. You can watch the video if you'd like to learn more. But um, mites have... They have a, an extensive, um, you know, various uh, uh, various ecological regions they've gone into. They basically are in all kinds of niches, and the ones we're dealing with are mostly herbivorous. Most mites, like spider mice, broad mice, and resin mice, are what you're going to be dealing with with medicinal plants generally. And um, the damage that they cause is usually through feeding on plant cells. Uh, and usually they can be kind of innocuous. Some mites are even beneficial, like in the soil. Whereas insects, for example, they are kind of, they're a smaller group for one, a taxonomic range smaller. Uh, but there's actually maybe even more parasitic wasps and beetles than there are like basically any other organism on earth. So insects are incredibly adaptive, um, highly adaptable. They basically are shrimp that learned how to live in not the ocean, but the air uh, by, by evolving wings. So the first animals on Earth to have winged flight, so powered flight by, the, by their own wings and not by gliding and things like that. And there's all kinds of insects. The ones that you have to deal with typically are things like thrips and the hemiptera, so like aphids and other insects with like a piercing mouth part. Um, you've got, uh, you've got insects that have chewing mouth parts too, like for example, caterpillars, which eventually become moths and butterflies, which all butterflies are moths. Uh, I could go on and on, but, um, the, the four biggest groups of insects that people deal with are, or that, that there are actually on earth are flies, moths, beetles, and the hymenotera, which are wasps, bees, and, and ants. So they're all, uh, related. And I bring these up because they're the the four biggest groups. They're called the big four. Um, and so you'll also notice that all of these are insects that have the larva, pupa, adult life stage development. Now, mites don't have that. They have a different sort of life stage, but it's basically like the earliest insects had, where they just start off as a little nymph that looks like the adult, and they get bigger and bigger and bigger, and they, and they become the adult. Anyways, that's your, uh, <laughs> that's your evolutionary nutshell. Now, that's a great explanation. I think that's helpful for not only me, but many of my audience as well, knowing the difference between those two. So talk to us a little bit more about the big four that you mentioned as far as insects and like solutions, some solutions in order to eliminate them. Yeah, so the big four, again, flies, beetles, wasps, bees, and ants, and uh, moths. And I think caterpillars 
the so larval moths are like the biggest issue that most people are dealing with, I think, or the strongest one that people uh, encounter because there's so many different ones out there. Uh, uh, across the earth, you're probably going to deal with some kind of caterpillar that can feed on the plant that you're dealing with. And I think that the best way to deal with caterpillars is to first understand that generally they're going to become they're going to become active in the spring and um, maybe late spring time. And you're going to have populations usually that were pupating either in debris or they were in soil or something like that, and then they they overwinter and they come out as adults, at least if you're in a place where it winters. If you're in a tropical area, then they're probably just constantly around. And that's important because this first population, they're going to be moving across your region. So if you're in the USA, uh, maybe they start off in like southwest USA and then they move south, uh, northeast, essentially a northeasterly movement. As the uh, temperature increases, you get more of them. Like with the budworm moth, um, Helicoverpizaea, the corn earworm that people deal with, with uh, medicinal plants and really like 200 plus crops across Earth. Um, they start off in the spring and summer. They, they ramp up into late summer. They become super active and they move across Earth or across the U.S. from the corn belt especially. So there's a place in the USA where most of the corn is produced, various states. Um, like in kind of in the Midwest and North Midwest area mostly. So that place is like a powder keg. And then the moths will uh, disperse from that location to other parts of the USA. So if you kind of know that there's this rhythm that you can pay attention to, you can avert it by, for example, germinating later in the year or getting plants that germinate later in the year uh, or earlier in the year. Some way that allows you to harvest before or after the peak where the budworms are going to go after the flower. That's one example. There are many ones out there. Got it. Some really good info there. And I know there's a lot more that can be said about mites and insects. Uh, we could have a whole whole episode on each one of those topics, really. But let's, let's keep it brief. Let's move on to the next thing we have here on the list, which is fungi. Talk to us about fungi. There are all kinds of fungi, right? But I think that my favorite ones to talk about are the uh, powdery mildews and the necrotrophs, the like botrytis and things like that. I like to bring these up because they represent two different pathways to colonizing plants. Powdery mildews are what we call biotrophs, so they require a living host to feed on. One interesting, th interesting thing about powdery mildew, which you uh, heard me talk about at the Soil Summit, was that powdery mildews, if you go back far enough, they're related to fungi that broke down plant tissues. Um, so they have the same genes that they use to break down the cellulose in plant cells. So perhaps they evolved from these fungi that used to break down decaying plant matter, and they became really good at breaking down living plant matter instead. So they became parasites. And I think that's really interesting when it comes to the soil food web and that kind of thing where... What could be a beneficial can eventually become a parasite given enough time and, uh, you know, uh, familiarity with the host, so to speak. And powdery mildews, they, um, they are not systemic. Some people think they're a systemic pathogen, but things like botrytis are or fusarium are, whereas powdery mildew only exists on the epidermis of the plant. So only kind of like skin deep, but they, um, they, uh, they're really good at colonizing the plants once they've established. So when you see different spots colonized, uh, it's not because they're moving through the tissue, it's because they're recolonizing the host. And powdery mildews are not super detrimental to their plant host, typically, whereas things like botrytis, they get onto the plant, they trick the plant to kill itself. It tricks the cells to uh, destroy themselves, and they sop up the nutrients afterwards. So they're a real threat and uh, they can attack different parts of the plant. Botrytis, for example, is commonly associated with the flower, right? Uh, with the rotting of flor floral tissue in particular. We also get things like fusarium that will attack things like the roots or the stem. And sometimes you have plants where everything looked fine, but then like a few days later, uh, it suddenly starts to wilt. Um, you don't know what's going on. You check the roots and you see that there's um, all kinds of like oozing, you know, tissue and uh, dilapidated uh, structures. And it's because this fungus attacks the tissue and like immediately destroys the roots. And once the roots are gone, 
there's really not very much for the plant. Or if the stem is really damaged, then there's not a lot of nutrient transfer. It dies very quickly. So you got to you gotta know these two different kinds of fungi. Some of them are not a huge deal. Some of them are a huge deal, and they can be a quick problem. So having a plan, knowing that those things are even possible, and then having something that you can apply beforehand, like a microbe or... Um, or a compound or something like that. And also just keeping your plants hygienic is also really helpful. Maybe chopping and dropping is not always the greatest when it comes to these uh, pathogens that can be uh, on or in the tissues. Or if you are going to do something like that, like compost it, process it, and then reapply it. I had bud rot before. You know, when you mentioned that, it just brought up uh, memories, bad memories, of course. Botrytis scenario had that. I actually had indoors the oscillating fan died overnight. And so uh, there was just that stagnant air, humidity r- rose, right? It ended up attacking four of my plants, if I remember correctly. Four of the plants had botrytis in it, bud rot. And uh, it was just really in the main cola. So uh, these are plants where I had really huge buds. And it was really just this main cola that kind of stuck up more. It was bud rot right in the middle because of it. And a lot of people was kind of surprised because, you know, obviously, I corrected the problem, right? So this was late in flowering when the fan died. I corrected the problem within, I think, 24 to 48 hours, right? But correct me if I'm wrong, that is enough time in order for it to kind of establish from there. And then I spent two more weeks growing the plants. Well, that doesn't mean that since I have air circulation now that it's just going to stop growing, right? So it'll continue to spread, right? So I get to harvest and then realize, oh my gosh, I had bud rot. It must have been from when my fan died two weeks ago. So um, that wasn't fun. Now I was able to still utilize the bottom buds that didn't have bud rot. And I know some people are against that. They say, hey, you got bud rot in one part of the plant, throw away the entire plant. Other people are going to say, hey, just cut off that bud that's impacted. The rest of the plant is fine. What's your take on that? Yeah, that's a good question because it is systemic. Like I said, I think that if you're seeing, like if you don't see the colonization of the the tissues itself, so now you can't necessarily see some of these things because they're microscopic, right? So I think that having a a cautious approach is definitely valid. Uh, Certainly you could do something like that. Generally though, I think um, at at the very least, like not necessarily at a home grow uh, perspective when you're growing plants by yourselves, like even if you have like produce, like Botrytis will colonize the fruit tissue or the floral tissue. Um, you know, like, you know, maybe, maybe discard the orange that has the fungus, but maybe don't necessarily discard the orange or the, or the fruit that has no signs of, uh, of mycosis essentially. But if you've got like that moldy, uh, 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 development, that farinaceous odor, maybe, maybe cut that part out. Don't, don't try your luck with that one. I think that's totally valid. Um, but from a commercial level, you know, you might be looking at different things, uh, you might be able to perceive through testing and other things if there is other stuff that you don't want people to be exposed to as well. So it d- definitely makes sense to to be cautious. Um, and I think that also uh, one other thing I'd like to say is that bud rot doesn't necessarily uh, only colonize the floral tissue. And in some cases, in some plants, uh, it can be a foliar pathogen or even a stem or a root pathogen. I don't wish bud rot upon anyone. It is not fun at all. It's It's... The feeling of going all the way to the point where you're ready to harvest and then realizing that you've got bud rot, it's just a feeling that I don't want anybody to have. Such a waste. It's yeah. a, it just feels so bad. I totally agree with that. Let's get into bacteria next. So yeah, just open-ended question there. Talk to us what you know about bacteria and what we need to know. Basically, with regards to IPM and also with regards to plant health, the most interesting thing for me is that the there's this like idea that there's like a fungal or bacterial dominance that you might be looking to accentuate, and I think that that's not necessarily the a correct dichotomy. Um, there's bacteria that are beneficial, those that are detrimental, and then those that even work with each other as well. Um, it's hard to get a good snapshot of the microbes going going on in the uh, soil microbiome, but also even on the um, phytoplane of the foliage. Um, I think that it helps to envision the plant's surface as like a hostile environment for the most part. You got these jagged trichomes and um, stomata and waxen secretions and things. And I think that uh, without getting into too much detail, one of the 
best things people can do from an IPM perspective is try to apply some of these bacteria that have a pathogenic effect against parasites, uh, but not just insects and mites, but also like fungi. There's bacteria that you can apply, and even fungi as well, that you can apply to the foliage and to um, other tissues, like the roots, that will uh, either colonize the, those tissues uh, internally or just on the surface. And they will create a disruptive environment where other microbes that you don't want are not able to uh, colonize very well. You can also combine this with, so not just microbes or bacteria that parasitize uh, like fungi and other bacteria, but also those that produce antimicrobial compounds and that kind of a thing. But the most important thing is to find things that will play nicely with each other. And there's a lot more research to uncover. But um, if we take uh, a look at the ecology of microbes and bacteria on different kinds of plants, we can find what works maybe more generally and then apply those to other plants. And that kind of research is ongoing. Bacteria is super fascinating. I mean, once I learned that 99.9% .9 of the bacteria we haven't even discovered yet or researched yet, it just blew my mind that there's so much that we don't know. <laughs> So much more to uncover, and we won't uncover it in our lifetime, that's for sure. <laughs> and the next thing to talk about is, is pretty interesting to me as well, which is viruses. So uh, again, want to hand the microphone over to you and just drop some knowledge bombs on us in regards to viruses. What do we need to know? Here's the biggest knowledge bomb. Um, I was reading a report recently that talked about the uh, sort of evolution of viruses, and basically they talked about how it's, it's, it's possible that when cellular life as we know it, and even pre-cellular life as we know it, sort of developed, things like viroids, for example, are not quite viruses, right? They're like strands of RNA. And it's thought that there was a pre-DNA world, an RNA world, and that viroids are basically like a relict of that era of life history. And viruses, though, perhaps especially RNA viruses, they may have been like the first things that became uh, like what we now think of as the nucleus of cells. It's possible that as like a genetic component, viruses are basically, you know, part of us and have been for the entirety of cellular life on earth. Knowledge bomb. But um, <laughs> so what I'm trying to say here is that we shouldn't be surprised that um, there are various kinds of viruses out there. Some of them are detrimental, obviously, but actually a lot of them are either neutral or even beneficial for their hosts. Some of them exist inside our genome uh, as retroviruses. Some of them um, can escape uh, or, or genetic codes that escape from other cells and things like that. Um, so that's a little bit high minded, but uh, I think it shows uh, contextually exactly what we're dealing with here. These uh, organisms or not organisms that are like quasi life and um, are there around and they basically work like molecular um, uh, additions, basically. Um, and so bring it down to IPM, though, we have things like viroids that are a huge pain for exactly that reason. It's because things like hoplatin viroid, you know, they, they're basically strands of genetic code that our cells or in this case, the plant cells, they take and they go, oh, this is plant RNA, let me replicate you. And by replicating the RNA of the viroid and not everything else it's supposed to do for the cell, you get these weird things like stunting, chlorosis, other kinds of weird damage, because you have these oddball genes that are just not being uh, expressed in the plant, which are very important. And so viruses also, um, they can do things weird like You've got these recombination viruses where their genome is split up into different chunks and they move between different plants and then recombine with each other. Um, it's very fascinating. Um, and unfortunately, there's not a whole lot of conventional solutions for viruses because they're basically genetic code. And it's very hard to target genetic code without targeting the plant's code, too. It's pretty scary. You know, once I heard uh, particularly about hoplite viroid being identified at 73% of commercial facilities in the U.S., that just kind of blew my mind. And the fact that in California alone, 90% of facilities, uh, medicinal plants, tested positive for hoplite viroid. So I can only imagine the amount of people that are that have hoplite viroid in their garden 
and don't know it. And they are seeing deficiencies, seeing plant problems and trying to figure it out. But it's really a viroid, which they really can't do anything about. So it's really scary. I know it comes into, it, it can be within the seed. It can be transferred in water as well. Next week, the guest that's coming on this podcast is going to talk all about hoplite and viroid. So you guys stay tuned for that one. That's going to be real in depth, all about hoplite and viroid. And I'm looking forward to that conversation. Now, is there any other viruses or viroids besides hoplite and viroid that's kind of worthy of, of mentioning and keeping an eye out for? Yeah. So I want to say one thing about hoplite and viroid uh, in particular is that it was recently found that other plants, like we call these, we give viruses these names. Typically, the first host we find them in and a symptom that they have about them, like tobacco mosaic virus, right, for example. Um, so hop latent viroid, right? And what, what's interesting, though, is that hop latent viroid has been found in things like tomato, sunflower, cucumber, and um, its ability to transfer from parent to offspring through seed. Uh, and other older research was kind of low. In newer research, it's showing really high transmission rates vertically from parent to offspring. Um, so it can be not just in hop. It could be in other plants, too, that you might be growing in your garden. It could be in other commercial plants that are being sold right now. And they're not being tested. Um, so that's just a thing to consider. So I would definitely check out that viroid video upcoming. Um, there's a lot of information that we should be kept up on. Other viroids, though, there's um, um, there are stunt viroids in other kinds of plants. Uh, citrus um, gets a viroid, for example. Um, that's pretty common. Peanut, for example. Um, but there's also viroids that have been found in the human oral microbiome, uh, or at least viroid-like things. Recently, it came out these so-called obelisk-like um uh, viroids that were found in the bacteria in our own mouths and in all the continents on earth they uh they went through and they categorized the uh, genetic structure of these obelisks and they found them in uh, human samples so we even have viroids in and around ourselves too it seems like and as our ability to sequence and look in finer and finer detail increases we'll probably be able to find more and more things like that um Generally, though, I mean, like, uh, there's a, there's some viruses that are going around right now in tomato that are a huge deal, uh, ring spot virus, for example. Um, there are, um, I guess, the, another big one that people are dealing with a lot is B. curlitop virus, very common. A lot of people know about it. Um, it's spreading all throughout uh, various medicinal plants in the USA and abroad. Um, it's vectored by the beet leafhopper pretty much solely. And we have found that uh, viruses that are like 95 to 98% the same as like vir BCTV we find in tomatoes and peppers in the area, they're coming back very similar. So it means that these bee leafhoppers are going into crops and they're taking up the virus and then they're moving into medicinal crops and other plants and also plants that are just living around in the environment. And they act as reservoirs. And so if you live in these areas like Nevada and Arizona and other places where BCTV is very common um, or Colorado, then uh, you should be aware of that and have some plans for finding the symptoms, which is usually like a stunting in the leaves and a curling of the leaves and chlorosis as well. But uh, if you're suspect, you should definitely get it tested uh, to find out if you can. Because then you know that probably you won't be able to find a solution, unfortunately, and then you should use your resources for something else. Super interesting stuff. Yeah, it's good that there is some testing out there now that you can get. If, if you feel like you might have a virus, go out and get it tested. There's some affordable options out there. So that's good stuff. So one of the questions I like to ask uh, almost on every episode towards the end is, really looking for advice. Like I mentioned, we have a lot of beginners that tune into this podcast. What advice do you have for beginners who are battling pests for the first time? I think the number one advice, for especially for beginners, is to learn what pests you might be able to deal with. So not just for your particular region, although that's very crucial. And you can find information out from various kinds of research reports you can look up. There are extension agents for various places in the world that you can go to to find out what is a problem in your region for the plants that you're trying to grow. 
and then also having a plan. So if you already know some of those pests or you've encountered them already, then learning about not only those, but the ones that you might not have encountered yet is so important. It's so useful. It's like gold because you aren't going to be running around um, panicking because you've never dealt with this problem before and you don't know what to do and you've never even looked into it. So just having that, it's just such a, um, it's just such a valuable thing in adversity to have that knowledge set in the beginning before you deal with a problem. That's probably the number one advice. I completely agree with that. Okay, so let's wrap things up. Tell us, how can the listeners find you and what do you have upcoming in the future? You can find me for professional inquiries at zenthanol.com. You can also check out my informational videos about plant health, pests, and other interesting facts at uh, youtube.com slash zenthanol. And you can also find my musings on my personal account at Angel on Instagram and on X. And you can also uh, go join my Patreon for as little as $1 a month. You can check me out. You can ask me questions and also ask a community of about maybe 140 people now um, for advice regarding IPM and that sort of a thing. So that's also an, an option as well if you're interested. Patreon.com slash Sentinel. So among other things, one thing that I've been doing is trying to write a book. Obviously, I helped you out with your hey, book. Nice. And um, I'm also working on a book about this Everswarm concept. It's basically um, all you need to know about IPM, some high-level theory out there, and also some practical applications of a system of systems approach and a multi-domain a holistic approach to pest management, not just products on a list, but how can you look at the ecosystem, pests, plants, and all the various organisms therein. And I'm very excited to work on it. Hopefully I'll be done sometime at the end of this year or beginning of next year. Awesome. Well, Matthew, once again, this was loaded with information. I appreciate you dropping those knowledge bombs on us. I learned so much and I have a feeling a lot of my audience has learned so much as well. So Thank you so much for your time today and hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks. You too. Have a blast. Peace out, everyone. Catch you in the next episode.